are here today. I'm thankful for the uh, warm uh, 30 degrees we feel after the uh, very cold couple days that we had. Uh, we're here to lift up the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So uh, I am thankful for those of you that are here, and if there's any visiting with us, welcome. I'm thankful for the uh, technology we have, that those that maybe can't be here can participate and can watch now, or maybe even later, online. Let's pray and thank God for this opportunity. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person here today. It's not an accident that they are in this place at this time. Your Holy Spirit has drawn them here. Thank you. Lord, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit would speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, that as we read the scriptures, as we sing the songs, as we hear your word preached, as we come to you in communion today, that, Lord, uh, we would be drawn closer in relationship to you. And that you would get all the glory and the honor. And I pray that we would spend today in awe of who you are and what you have done for each one of us. Thank you for the technology that allows us to be online. And I pray that that technology would work well and uh, stay strong throughout the whole service. We love you, Lord. We need you and praise you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Psalm 24, you're going to hear a lot about that today, is our call to worship. So I invite you to stand. It's on the screen. Diane is going to lead us in it. Let's let the God's Word call us to worship. Thank you. 
Amen. You may be seated. You ready? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And then you have to go, bum, bum, bum. Okay? Can you sing it with me? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Bum, bum, bum. One more time. My God is so big. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Bum, bum, bum. Have you ever sung that before? No? Well, now maybe you can sing it. But the reason I wanted you to hear now that, it's stuck, in my head. it's stuck in your head. Good. <laughs> the reason I wanted you to hear that is because I'm going to talk with the other kids, the adults, about how God is the one who is in control of all things. He's mighty. Well, he's in control of all things. He will use troubles, and he will use everything for his glory. So, is God mighty? There's nothing he can't do, right? That's what we just said. Does that sound right? All right, can you remember that? Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God can do. Who made you? What else did God make? Everything. And why did God make you and everything else? For his own glory. Can you all say that? For his own glory. Alright, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these kids. They're awesome. Thank you for bringing that song to my mind. 
that we can share it with, with this generation. And I pray, Lord, that that would be stuck in our heads all the time. That you are strong, and you are mighty, and you are in control, and we can come with you. And you love us. You made us, you made everything else for your own glory. Thank you, Lord. I pray that these kids would know Jesus from now till eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, you can get a, a snack here. Yeah. You can get a snack. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you're here. Every day. <laughs> I love it. Well, today will be probably different. I think, I don't know if I've ever done this before. The sermon is only on one verse. One verse. It's in uh, Revelation chapter 1. So I invite you to turn there. And we're going to pray first, uh, but then I will read Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Lord, I love the excitement of the kids. I love the smile on their faces. I love the truth that it's not just for little kids, but it's for us too, that you are big and, and mighty. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I pray, Lord that you would put us in awe of who you are. Not by words that, that I have, but because of who you are and what your Holy Spirit shows us from your word. Lord, I, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are my rock. You are my redeemer. I pray that you would speak to your people and that our response today would be to be in awe and worship of you with all of our lives. We need you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. I pray that you would speak to your people from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've mentioned this before. A number of years ago, I think it was actually back in the VHS days, so it's been a while. A movie came out, and the, the title of the movie was... Bruce Almighty. And if you remember that movie, Bruce was a TV reporter in Buffalo. And he wanted to be moved from reporter up unto the anchor man, and he did not get the promotion. And when he did not get the promotion, he yells at God. And there's this great scene, it stars Jim Carrey. And there's this great scene where he's just yelling at God. And in a sense, in the movie, what Bruce is saying is, you don't know what you're doing. I could do your job better than you. So in the Hollywood imagination, God, played by Morgan Freeman, says to Bruce, fine. You think you can do a better job? Bruce, the job is yours. It's actually, at least in my opinion, an incredible moment from Hollywood where we get a movie that, that makes a pretty nice statement. Human beings are not God, and we're not meant to be God. There's only one God, and he is actually the only one capable of doing his job. I want to talk today about the true Almighty. The one who has ultimate power. That one verse that I read to you today reveals to us something about our triune God. And when I say triune God, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it's in his own voice. Did you notice that? 
when I read the verse, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. This is the Lord speaking to us. And what he shows us, what he reveals to us, is that he is the one who holds sway over all things. And I pray that our response will be awe and worship. May we stand in awe of the one who holds sway over all things and seek to live for his honor and glory in all we do. I was captivated by this Greek word that is translated in that verse as almighty. And the Greek word is pantokrator. I had to sound it out for me in my notes, so I say it right. Pantokrator. Lisa, go ahead and put that up there if you would. I couldn't get the, the Greek thought to show up on here. So, so you don't have it. But this word Greek, this word pantokrator, in a Greek definition, in, a, in an old textbook to help you know what Greek words mean. This was literally the definition. He who holds sway over all things. Now, we're all football fans, or most of us are football fans, and, and, and in the National Football League, the commissioner is Roger Goodall. And he holds sway over all things in that particular area of the world, the NFL. You know, I prefer baseball, and the commissioner of Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred, he holds sway over all things as long as they're part of Major League Baseball. When you're a kid, your parents hold sway over all things in your life. When you're an inmate, the ward holds sway over all things in that particular part of life. But this definition is the one who holds sway in all things. You could also define it ruler of all or all powerful. Pantocrator. I don't expect you to remember that. As long as you remember the English version, which is almighty. Now for fun, you will remember that Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek so that people could read it in later times. Well, in Hebrew, you have the, the word Yahweh Sabaoth. Sabaoth. Or sometimes it's Elohim Sabaoth. Sometimes it's a different word, Yahweh Shaddai. You find that phrase in 2 Samuel 5.10 where it says this, David became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. That's the NIV. The King James says David became more and more powerful because the Lord God of hosts was with him. That Hebrew word, Sabaoth, means the captain of the heavenly armies. Now, you might have seen that word. We sing it. It's in the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Lord Sabaoth is named. And if you're like me for most of my life, I just assumed that whoever typed it into the computer misspelled Sabbath. But that's not the case. Sabaoth means the captain of the army, God's military, powerful name. Lord of hosts. And when you look up 2 Samuel 5, 10, in the Hebrew, it says, Yahweh Alehu Sabaoth, Lord God of hosts. When you translate that into Greek, it says, Kyrios Pantocrator, Lord Almighty, one who holds sway over all things. Well, I don't want to bore you with more Greek. I want to show you where it is used in the book of Revelation, and it's used five times in worship. Revelation 4.8, you've got these four 
living creatures that are crazily described around the throne of God. And these four living creatures say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation eleven seventeen. you've got these 24 elders around the throne of God. And they say, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. In Revelation 15, 3, you have those who have been victorious over the beast and his image and his number. And they say, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Revelation 16, 17, the altar itself speaks and says, yes, Lord God Almighty, True and just are your judgments. And then finally, Revelation 19, 6, a great multitude shouts, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. I want to give a little shout out here to our praise team. I asked them if we could sing that song, Holy, Holy, you are Lord God Almighty. <laughs> We've, we've played that song, but it's been a long time, and we've never sang the whole thing before. So I'm thankful to our praise team for saying, yeah, we're doing a great job. Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Two other times in the book of Revelation, it's used to speak of the day of the Lord, the judgment of God Almighty's wrath. And then one time, it's used in a sentence that states how in the new heavens and the new earth, there's no temple because the one who holds sway over all things is the temple. Revelation 21, 22 says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. We are meant to worship the Ponta Croft. The one who holds sway over all things. In Psalm 24, which was our call to worship, it tells us why. Now, I, I, I told you that, that Pantocrator is the Greek, and usually it translates the Yahweh Saba Oath. And it comes out as Lord of Hosts. We see that in Psalm 24. Now, full disclosure, it's actually not the word uh, Ponta Prata there. I don't know why. But in Psalm 24, where in our English version it says, Lord God of hosts, it's Yahweh Sabaoth in Hebrew, and it's Curious Dupinus, Lord of power. Dunamis is the word from which we get dynamite. And I looked up synonyms of dunamis, and one of the synonyms, not synonym, synonyms of dunamis was kratos, from which we get ponta kratos. So I think it is safe to say that when it says Lord of hosts, that this psalm is related to this idea of the ponta kratar, the one who holds sway over all things. And Psalm 24 starts out by telling us why he holds sway over all things. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the water. Why does the Lord God Almighty Hold sway over all things because he made all things. He created everything and this world belongs to him. In the 1900s, I believe, or the late 1800s, there was a guy named Abraham Kuyper. He was the prime minister of the Netherlands and he was a 
faithful believer in Jesus Christ. He has a famous quote that says this. There's not one, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. There's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Now, here is where it gets amazing. The one who holds sway over all things, because he created all things, and he can claim, that's the property of me, that's the property of me, that's the property of me, also loves us. Psalm 24 asks the question, we read it in our call to worship, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? In other words, it's asking this question. Who can be in the presence of the Pantocrator? Who can be in the presence of the one who holds sway over all things? And the psalm answers its own question. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. So no one. No one. All human beings are eliminated from the presence of the Pontifat. Because I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone with clean hands and a pure heart that hasn't been lifted up to something false or swear to something deceitful. If that's where we were left, it would be a sad, sad reality. That's not where we're left. The New Testament, over and over, and over and over, tells us that the Pantocrator, the one for which you must have clean hands and a pure heart in order to be in his presence, he loves us dirty, rebellious, sinful humans. John 3.16 tells us that. 1 John 4, 4, 9 and 10. Ephesians 2, 4. Revelation 1, 5. You remember a couple weeks ago. He loves us and freed us from sin by his blood. That's the good news of the gospel. We can't enter into his presence on our own. But when we receive what he did on the cross, when we are in Christ, we can stand in his holy presence. We can know the one who holds sway over all things, now and for eternity. So far, I've talked about one word in one verse. Listen to the whole verse again. Lisa, you can put it up there if you want, but, uh, the verse. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I learned a neat term this week, and some of you may know it, particularly if you paid attention in English class more than I did. But the, the term is a merism. Merism is a literary device where you state something and you state its opposite and by stating it and its opposite, you mean these two and everything in between. Here's an example. Think of a car commercial. We have all your automobile needs from A to Z. By saying A to Z, they also mean everything in between. They'll help you get into the car. When it's time to get rid of it, of course, they'll help you get out of it and get into another one. And in between, they're going to take care of your brakes. They're going to take care of your tire rotations. They're going to take care of your oil changes. That's a literary device called a merism. We state the end, we state the beginning, and everything else is included within it. Well, listen to what this verse says about the one who holds sway over all things. I'm the Alpha. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. I'm the Omega. 
It's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And he's everything in between. He created the heavens and the earth. He will see it through until the new heavens and the new earth. And he will take care of everything and everyone who trusts in him in between. He is, he was, and he is to come. I learned something else neat this week that I wanted to share with you. I don't even remember who it was that said this. It's a Bible scholar. But they said if you look at, at this little succession of Psalms 22, 23, and 24, that in those three Psalms you have who God, what he has done, what he is, and what he will do. What do I mean? Psalm 22 is what God has done. That's the psalm that Jesus quoted on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What God has done is taking care of sin at the cross. Psalm 23, you know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That is who God is. He's our shepherd leading us, guiding us, taking us through life. So we have what God has done in 22, who God is in 23, and then we have 24. 24 is what you would call an entrance liturgy. And what I mean by that is you would sing this on your way to the temple to worship. You would sing this song. Look at the end of Psalm 24. It's in your bulletin in there if you want to look at it. And the end of it says, Lift up your heads, O gates. So the gates of the city are, are personified. They're, they're given actions of a human. Lift up your heads, gates. Be lifted up, ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh, the Lord, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh of hosts. Lord, Yahweh, Saba host. <coughs> he is the king of glory. I understand that when a victorious king would come enter a city, there would be a lot of pomp and circumstance. Did you watch what happened at Gobbler's Knob this past week on Groundhog Day? They're having all kinds of crazy stuff and songs and fireworks, but now it's time to get serious. It's time to get ready for Punxsutawney Phil's prediction. They literally said to the crowd of people, Form an aisle! Form an aisle! And once that aisle was formed, the men in the top hats and the tuxedos, known as the inner circle, walked victoriously through that aisle with great pomp and circumstance up onto the stage where the pronouncement of Punxsutawney Phil would be made. Now I know that's silly, but there was great pomp and circumstance around a little rodent. When a king would come back, the people would shout, who's at the gate? It's the King Victorious. Come in, King Victorious. Who's at the gate? The King Victorious. Come in, King Victorious. This entrance liturgy, Psalm 24, which was sung by the people on the way up to the temple, is also looking ahead to the return of the Lord of hosts to the return of the King, Jesus. Who is this King? It's the Lord God, strong, mighty, the captain of the heavenly army, the Pontifex, the one who holds sway over all things. Psalm 21, 22, what Jesus did on the cross. Psalm 23, what he is right now, the good shepherd. Psalm 24, who is to come, the king of all creation. 
Well, so what, Pastor Jefferson? I'm probably not going to remember that on the cross or uh, a word once we, we leave the parking lot. And that's fine. I probably won't either. But I hope you'll remember that English word, almighty. So pray that you will be in awe. That you will be in awe that the one who made all things, the one who has the, the creativity to come up with elephants and flowers and tulips and, and daisies and us. That the one who created everything and is in charge of everything and holds sway over everything <clears throat> said, I, I love you guys. And I'm going to send my son Jesus so that he can die in your place and rise again so we can be in a relationship. I hope you'll be in awe. I hope you'll worship. Because I don't know how we could hear that story and just walk away and say, yeah, okay, good. The one who holds sway over all things, who created all things, who we have no right to be in his presence, took on flesh and blood, lived among us, died on a cross, rose again, so that we can know him now, we can know him forever. He will provide for us, he will take care of us, he will, from A to Z, from Alpha to Omega, hold us until he comes again. May we stand in awe of the one who holds sway over all things, and seek to live for his honor and glory. Grace you know. Heavenly Father, thank you. Maybe I'm just making too much of, of one word, but Lord, I was struck in my being by that word. By that description of who you are. And how you deserve that description because of who you are. And how on my own, and in my own strength, and in my own power, I have no claim to friendship with you, to relationship with you. Yet you say, I love you, and you give your blood so that I can know you. Oh Lord, if there's anybody here that maybe has never had that relationship with you. I pray that today would be the day they would simply turn from their sin and trust you and follow you. Find themselves as your son or your daughter as your word promises. It doesn't make us perfect and it doesn't make life great, but Lord, we are with the one who made us now and forever. Lord, maybe that there's those here today and they understand that. They've been in that relationship with you. I, I just pray that today it would be deepened. It would be deeper in awe of who you are as the one who holds sway over all things. Speak to our hearts, Lord God. Thank you for your word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We respond to God's word in a number of different ways. Uh, the first Sunday of the month, we get to respond by coming to his table and receiving the sacrament that he gave us, the sacrament of communion. Now, you've heard me say it, but I get to say it every time because maybe someone wasn't here or um, the folks from Billy Graham tell you that people only remember 10% of what you say. So maybe this time you'll remember a little more. That is that God gave us these sensible signs. What we can touch, what we can taste, what we can smell, what we could hear if I was to pour the juice in here. He gave us these sensible signs that point to the reality of the union with him. That Kennywood arrow. That, that, that arrow's not the joy of Kennywood. 
it points us to the joy of kindred. This is the arrow pointing us to the joy of communion with the Lord. This isn't the table that belongs to Hanover Presbyterian Church. It's not a table that belongs to the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. It is the Lord's table. And those are welcome who come to him in faith, repentance, and love. The scriptures do tell us, examine your heart. If you have some unconfessed sin, confess that sin. Take care of things and then come and receive grace and receive mercy. And certainly parents and grandparents, if the kids at their own age level understand what is going on, that this isn't just some mid-service snack, this is the presence of the Lord, then they are welcome as well. Come to this table. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Come to this table. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help us to understand that, that I don't come to this table on my worth. No one comes to this table on their worth. We come to this table on your worth and what you have done and how you have shed blood for us. Lord, thank you. You didn't even have to give us anything, and you gave us bread and juice, and the idea of eating together, something a family does, something friends do. And somehow, in a way that we just can't put into words, you are here with us when we do that. And we're connected to each other, we're connected to brothers and sisters around the globe, connected to those believers that are already with you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask a, some elders to come up and uh, serve as they pass back the bread. Hold on to it. Then they'll pass back the juice. Hold on to it. We'll take everything together. <laughs>
that he was arrested, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to God. And they gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance. Likewise, he took the cup. So this cup is the blood of the new covenant, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. Let's stand and Concerns in Sunday school. You know each one of them for healing, comforting those who are grieving loss. Lord, we, we lift them up to you and ask for your mercy. And Lord, I at this time, if anyone has something they want to lift up directly to you. I want to give them the time now of praying directly to you out loud, a prayer of praise or concern. I ask for direction today, mercy, and healing. Lord, I Thank you. 
Prayers for our local firemen for having a busy weekend. Prayers and thanks for being with my mother and helping her through this. Also, prayers for my brother in law, but going through some heart issues. Prayers of gratitude for this heavenly body for holding with me and for me in my surgery and the last couple of days. Prayers for Jared's family as he lost his uncle. Lord, thank you for healing Diana's foot. Thank you for this body, Lord, that we can lift one another up to you. We can uh, share joys and we can share burdens. Thank you for the diversity of gifts that you've given to each of us to work together as a body. Lord, we pray for that ministry in, in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, we learned about um, this morning that has lost a uh, dormitory for the Christian school. And, and the roof of another school building, and we ask the, your mercy upon them and their patience and the opportunity to help them. Lord, we thank you and praise you for those that serve in missions around the world and here in the United States. Lord, we pray for our leaders at all levels and ask for your wisdom and discernment. Thank you for our family and friends, Lord, particularly the ones that, that don't know you as the one who has sway over all things. The Lord, you would open their hearts and give us the words to say and the words not to say, and the time to say it and the time not to say it. Thank you, Lord, for hearing all of our prayers. Now would you hear us as we come together praying the prayer you taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory We respond to God's word by giving of our time, our abilities, and the resources he has given us in the first place. So I invite the uh, ushers to come forward and receive the tithes and offerings given. <laughs> Jesus might go out throughout Western Pennsylvania and throughout your world, 
And I do pray that you will provide for every one of our needs. Thank you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Following the service, uh, there is a congregational meeting. It's our annual meeting to uh, elect officers for the, the new year. You're all welcome to uh, stay. Only those who are actual members uh, can vote. Uh, so that'll be uh, following uh, about five minutes after the end of the service. Um, you can see a bunch of other announcements on there. The one that I'll mention to you right now is we found out that when we go to the Lakeview Nursing Home on the 19th, the following day, the 20th, is Mitzi's 90th birthday. So if you'd like to have a card and you want to send it, that's fine. But if you'd like us to take a card that day, just make sure it's here at the church uh, by the, the 19th, and we'll take it. I have address labels. Oh. Okay, if you'd like to send it, Kathy has address labels. See her. But if you'd like us to take it, we can do that and just hopefully fill her up with cards um, for her birthday. There's other announcements there, but you can read them all. Anything else that needs to be mentioned out loud? Out all right, our closing song is an old, great one, and it incorporates that word again. Let's praise the Lord, the Almighty. It stands. him in all that we do. When we're done after the benediction, don't run off if you're a member so you can be part of the congregational meeting. But now we see the benediction. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.